Great. Okay. Thank you for that, Shana. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just jump in then. <laughs> um, I normally am used to seeing lots of faces sitting in the, the Zoom, but I, I, I realize this is more of a kind of webinar conference session. Um, so where can I start? I will say that I personally have had the privilege of working um, in the inner city of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And, um, and I only came into Winnipeg to go to university. And so I, you know, I did that too, and, and do have two university degrees. And, um, and so did a lot of learning there at the university, but really did a lot of learning once I came into the inner city to do my work, uh, to, to um, like get a job and, and do some work. And so, and, and even how that came about was through the university process, I needed to do a practicum or a, a work placement type of a situation. And I was directed towards the North End because <laughs> I wanted an indigenous policy placement. Um, because I had been doing some work in some systems, particularly the child welfare system, and I was very unimpressed with what I was seeing there uh, in terms of how the system was working. And what I saw was um, a lot of service being delivered that had really no understanding of Indigenous anything, really, yet all of the kids that were in our care for the most part were Indigenous and, and that really irked me. And so I went for my second degree and said I needed to, to do more policy work because I thought something needed to change. I was very upset about how it was and I and something needed to change. So, um, and so through that, I ended up in the inner city of Winnipeg and really walked into um, a group of, for, from, from my personal experience, it was a group of Indigenous women, not all Indigenous um, and, and not all women. I mean, there were there were also some men around, but again, the, the folks that I ended up gravitating towards and really learning from ended up being in primarily women and primarily Indigenous women. And they were like running everything. They were running all the organizations and running all the the groups and the coalitions and, and the um, the mobilizing. And so, I realized early on that that was the work I wanted to do. Like that just resonated so deeply for me and it felt so right um, that I knew this is where I needed to be. So I ended up staying in the city and I'm still here in Winnipeg, which, um, and I'm sure I know you've been getting together all day, um, but I am coming from this place uh, that we call Winnipeg. Uh, it does sit in uh, the treaty territory of Treaty One, and it is the um, the historical, uh, you know, home and lands of uh, of many nations, including I personally am Anishinaabe, and so it, it is our our uh, traditional land. It's also the Cree are here, the Indigi Cree are here, uh, the Dakota, the Dene uh, are all here. It's all of our traditional land. It's the homeland of the uh, Red River Métis Nation. And there's a whole history there around how Manitoba came into Confederation and how Manitoba became a part of Canada. That was a, in large part to one of our Métis leaders, Louis Riel. So when we, which as you probably recognize is a bit of a land acknowledgement, but when we talk about the land acknowledgement, I think what we're trying to acknowledge is that there are nations and people that have been here for a very long time and they have stewarded these lands and waters and spaces for a very long time. And they've taken really good care of, of the land. And that's what Mino Bamadzuwin is. That's in a, a, a concept in Anishinaabe, which means the good life. And for me, that good life is about living in balance and living in relationship with all my relations and all my relations being the land, the water, the animals, um, those are, we're all relatives. We don't privilege humanity in that. <laughs> Humans are just but one part of that ecosystem. And so Mino Bomadzuin is about living in balance with all of our relations and living in a way that we take care of each other and that we all may thrive so that the water can thrive, the land can thrive, the mountains can thrive, the trees can thrive, the 
you know, the birds can thrive, so on and so forth. And I do think that that's centering Indigenous wisdom, which if we could get back to the fulsome nature of that wisdom, um, you know, it would really hold out so much solution to some of the big challenges we find ourselves in right now. I was listening to one of our elders talk just the other day, and he basically, he's true, and we know this, he's saying, you know, we're on the path, humans are on the path to extinction because of, of what we're doing to, to the rest of our relations. And so the climate crisis that we find ourselves in um, is because we haven't been living that Mino Bomadzu and we haven't been living in that good balanced way with all my relations. I do feel like there are other knowledge systems out there that are more transactional than they are relational. And I would, there's lots of nations out there that are relational. I'm going to speak from the Anishinaabe perspective today because um, I know it to be an Anishinaabe approach, but I think, again, many Indigenous nations across Canada and the world also have these perspectives, and I think there's a lot of other cultural groups out there who also would have these perspectives. Um, the one that dominates, I think, a lot of our resourcing today are Western systems, and I do feel like those Western systems, knowledge systems, and other systems tend to center transactionality. They tend to center um this unilateral or this one way approach and so when we talk about mother earth or the water or you know we talk about extraction we talk about controlling water and waterways to produce hydroelectricity we talk about and i always make the example that hopefully you have a relation in your family in your life hopefully someone motherly to you whether it's a biological mother or somebody who's raised you or an auntie or a grandmother or just just someone who represents um, a, a maternal person in your life and so I make that equation to mother earth and I would hope that we don't talk about <laughs> extracting every ounce of value we can out of our mother and that all we are worried about is how well that serves me and that we don't worry about her and so we don't think about mutuality and we don't think about, well, if she's taking care of me, I have to take care of her. And so I personally do have a, a biological mother who I love very much. And I'm always worried about how she's being, how she's doing. I'm always, always worried about how is she doing emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, I want to spend time with her. I, I try to do all the life-giving things with her. I want her to connect to my children and um, you know, so this is how I think about my biological mother. <laughs> and, and so shouldn't I be thinking about that with Mother Earth? Or shouldn't I be thinking in that way with all my relations? So when I think about the water, I think about how am I taking responsibility for the water? How am I um, living in good balance in relationship with the water? And where where's my responsibility as well as where is my benefit? And so that's sort of getting into a lot of indigenous knowledge systems, which is what I think land acknowledgements are trying to get at if we had more time. So if you ask me to do a land acknowledgement, it's gonna take me half an hour, maybe even an hour to go get through, to, to say the things I want to say about why we are acknowledging the land and why are we are acknowledging all our relations. And it points to this role and responsibility that we have in centering relationships and centering relationality. And so I think that's kind of what I was asked to come here and talk about. And hopefully I seen some of the other speakers on, on your list today. And hopefully you've just been hearing that same message over and over and over again about how Indigenous approaches, Indigenous knowledge systems, Indigenous values um, can be centered and how they can help all of us to thrive. And again, when I say all of us, I don't mean just humans. <laughs> um, I, I do mean all, uh, all our relations. And so I feel like that is what needs to change in a lot of the systems that we have today, that those systems are designed, A, with human centricity in mind, um, but then for if you go further into the, the, the systems that are designed to supposedly help humans, um, that sometimes they don't help uh, and sometimes they're actually harming because of whose voices are being centered in the design of those systems. And so... Um, that's the work I do in the inner city. I primarily work with Indigenous people and have 
almost my whole career worked for Indigenous organizations, organizations that are governed from Indigenous people that deliver Indigenous services that are based on Indigenous experiences uh, and viewpoints. And so I do feel like I'm quite privileged to be able to say that that's the kind of background I have and that's the kind of education I've had. I also will say that I've been very privileged to be raised by my own family, like my mom and my dad, and my and I've lived with my siblings, and that I know all of my aunties and uncles, I know all of my cousins, like I was um, always raised around them. And so there were the systems out there didn't uh, break us apart, like, there's so many like justice, child welfare, you name it. Um, those systems didn't break us apart. And so I, I'm privileged enough or privileged to say that I was raised by my family and in my family. And that's not to say we didn't have the challenges and that will move into the next thing that I want to say about systems and systemic innovation <laughs> is that so many systems out there right now are designed from a Western uh, viewpoint and therefore don't often include Indigenous value bases, Indigenous worldviews, Indigenous knowledge systems. They don't even include our experiences and our perspectives. They don't include um, even our voice at all. <laughs> and so, uh, And so those are different levels of engagement in my mind. And then we wonder why those systems aren't serving Indigenous people very well. Um, and that's the reason, in my opinion, is because they, they're not designed by us, they're not in, they don't involve us, and so um, then they don't work for us. In Manitoba, which is where I am, um, I can only speak to some of the numbers here, but I do think these numbers are not new to other parts of Canada and probably to other parts of the world. But um, in Manitoba, the child welfare system, as an example, has over, these are the numbers from a few years back now, um, since before the pandemic, but I think they still hold, and if not, they've gotten worse, that over 11,000 children are in the care of the state or in the care of child protection, and 95% of those kids are Indigenous. And that system in 2018 costed the provincial government $500 million. So there is money in the system. We have to ask ourselves, where is that money going? And that, that, that's a whole analysis right there. When 95% of the kids are in the care of the state, when they're Indigenous, that does not mean that Indigenous people don't know how to care for their kids. We do. We do know how to care for our kids. And we know how to care for our kids in a way where they thrive versus what I think many of our systems right now are designed for just bare, bare survival, bare minimum. You talk about our justice, health, wellness, anything. It feels like they're all designed to provide resource and support at a very minimal level and just enough to keep you in survival mode. Whereas when in, at Boldness, I'll get into what we are. We are a, a social innovation lab. We're designing solutions. The design process is to center Indigenous people and to center our voices, our experiences, our worldviews, our values, to center us in defining what the problem is and then centering us in defining what the solution is. And so in that solution finding, our families almost always go to thriving. Pro we design prototypes and then we test those prototypes and we um, get fam directly with families and families tell us what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, again, the rapid feedback loops and so on and so forth that we can continue to further iterate and design a prototype until we feel like we've got it to a place where families really say this is the best way to serve us this this will lead to that transformational change everyone's always talking about this will lead to Mino Bamadzuwin living the good life this will lead to um, our children thriving uh, you know our families always go to thrive over survive and I feel like many of the systems that are in place today are about survive and those, again, in my opinion, are designed from a Western uh, perspective and Western approach and Western viewpoints and value bases. You can, I, you know, again, I've taken those numbers into the justice system, same scenario, 75%, conservatively speaking, 75% of those incarcerated are Indigenous. 
And that is not because we're criminally minded. <laughs> it's not because we're lawbreakers. I can go into the mental health system and tell you those same numbers. I can go into the housing. I can go into like just every system out there will keep those numbers. We're the least employed. We, we have the, we're not in the big jobs. We're not making the most money. We're um, probably have the most mental health issues. We're probably like, you know, the, have the least physical health. And all of those are to say that those systems are creating those outcomes for our people and not only our people, but certainly our people in, in the biggest way. And so again, we know how to take care of ourselves. We know about physical health. Before there was contact, before settlers first came, we had thriving political systems. We had thriving medicinal systems. We had thriving um, family systems. Like we were thriving in so many ways. And when the Western methodologies came into play, we were really interrupted. And so I still say to this day, we are interrupted and we need to get back to our original ways of, of living and, um, and that those original ways of living really can benefit all my relations and, and all, of, all of us humans, not only in Canada, but all around the world. And so how do we make space for those other ways of being, ways of knowing, being, doing, feeling is, is, is a, a phrase that we use. And you could Google that and, and it's out there in, in lots of different ways. So we're um, an innovation lab that tries to, we've been around for just going into 10 years now, nine, nine years now, going into our 10th year. And our, our first, what we knew at the start was that there is a ancient and robust knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems, not a, but many knowledge systems out there. And so we knew that that was at play here in the North end of Winnipeg. And so our task at the beginning of boldness was we knew we were going to be a social research and development project. And so what is it that we were gonna research and develop? And so it was this way of working or these ways of working with families that families are asking us for um, that lead to better health and wellness outcomes for families. And so, you know, the, the, the problem or the guiding question at the beginning was how do we improve uh, health and wellness outcomes for children's zero to six, so the babies? Um, simply put, how do we make it better for babies? Uh, and then we went straight to our community and asked our community all those questions. And we have a whole engagement process where we tap into so many different parts of our community here in Winnipeg, our community organizations, directly with our families, our knowledge keepers, our elders, um, they're so, you know, our, our um, innovators, our business community, our not-for-profit community, our corporate community, sorry, um, our government, you know, partners, we have all these different ways of tapping into the wisdom of all these different groups. And so we have a pretty robust engagement um, framework. And through that, we're able to gather up what, for us, what is the voice of community, which then guides our work and tells us what to do and how to do it and, and where to go and, and how to proceed. So, um, I don't know, we did have slides, but I'm not sure if they're available. And I know I don't know how to work them, so we might not get to them. <laughs> but um, the, the um, community voice, we eventually figured out, we didn't know this in the beginning because we were just sort of following indigenous methods. We figured out that what the community was telling us was actually the theory of change. And so it wasn't until at the back end that we went, oh, that's our theory of change. If we just work with families in these ways that they're asking us to work with them, that's what will create all this change that's needed in our communities and in our systems. And so it became our theory of change. So you can see that on the Boldness website. Um, it's called our ways of knowing, being, doing, and feeling. And it's also... Um, you know, our, our holistic early childhood development model. We, we do a lot of translating. And so we'll use language that we feel um, resonates for our community. And then we'll use language that also resonates for those outside of our community or that are more perhaps in the policy or academic field, perhaps 
Um, so sometimes it's we do a lot of translating. And because we're a social innovation lab, I feel like there's two main tenants to a social innovation lab. I mean, there's there's many approaches, but I think the two big ones are that you're all you're all about systems change. The point of your endeavor is to create systems change. And secondly, is to do it in a cross-sector collaborative way. And so with boldness, again, we we are in we're into philanthropy, we're into government, we're into the not-for-profit world, we're into corporations, you know, so on and so forth. We're into the research uh, community. And it's because we know that in order to do the things our families are asking for, we need everyone to play a part in that. And so everyone has a role and responsibility. And for me, that follows the Anishinaabe clan system teachings and clan system teachings are about that there's many voices in the circle. All voices are needed. And what our job is to understand the role and responsibility of each of those voices, because the voices are all different and they all play a different role. And so it's understanding where your voice, where the role is for your voice, because your voice doesn't necessarily belong in every single circle. And so where is your voice or where does it belong? And then what responsibility does your voice carry? Like when you're going to speak, what's your responsibility in speaking? And so that to me resonates um, according to clan system teachings. And so we have again, a very robust community engagement framework here that has many, many, many smart circles. And there's a different role and responsibility for each of those circles. And so they all work in in concert with each other. And so it's understanding the interconnectedness of all of those circles. And so again, I would say that Indigenous knowledge systems privilege interconnectedness. And so the ultimate goal of, of, of living, if you will, is, is to fundamentally understand the interconnected of all things, interconnectedness of all things. And I feel like a lot of Western systems privilege independence and that the goal is to be independent. And um, I've always associated the goal of being independent as linked to, to youthfulness and to teenagehood. <laughs> and at some point you mature and realize, oh, independence is not. <laughs> Um, you got to mature beyond independence and move into interdependence. And so understanding that um, you can never survive just by yourself. Like you, you just can't. That's that's just, <laughs> I think, natural law. And so how do we, and and that in order to achieve that mino babatsu and, and in order to achieve mutuality and, and uh, reciprocity, you have to really understand interconnectedness as best as you can. And so how are we interconnected and how do we foster uh, that interconnectedness even more so that we all may thrive. And so I feel like privileging interconnectedness is also how we center indigeneity because there's a group of things that cluster together around um, these approaches. So interconnectedness, I feel like groups really closely with centering relationship, relationality and relationships. It really centers like the, the concept of holistic thinking versus the, the siloed thinking. Um, it really centers this idea of um, I'm trying to think of what the words are, but when there's a um, when you allow for that kind of emergence, I will say that's connected to relationality, it breeds a certain level of safety and security. And so which is also lodged in reciprocity and mutuality. If, if I can have confidence that I'm constantly giving, that if all of us are doing that, then all of us are also receiving. And so you will always be receiving your whole life and therefore you will always be taken care of. And so that's where interconnectedness, mutuality, reciprocity um, all come together uh, and so that this idea of uh, accumulating <laughs> a lot as an individual is is a very unnatural thought for me, <laughs> even though we see it all around us in, in our Western economy. Um, and so even the idea of philanthropy is, is a little bit different, I think, for Indigenous people. 
because I, I don't know that we do the accumulation side of it. I think it's a constant giving. And so your, your character and your um, integrity and your standing in, in society is based on how much you give without the accumulation side of it. <laughs> um, and so again, those are indigenous concepts in my mind and indigenous approaches. And if we can center those kinds of approaches, we could be in a different place. And so um, keep linking it back, but boldness is trying to create prototypes or is creating prototypes that um, are testing these approaches and testing these ideas in, in lots of very tangible ways so that those who are interested in being different can have an example of something. And then we're always willing partners to, to help groups figure out how they might replicate that prototype or scale that prototype, uh, so on and so forth. Um, looking at the time, it's 2.30, and I'm, I know we don't necessarily have a moderator. Um, I know that there was supposed to be some time for Q&A somewhere in here. Um, I've always just allowed for questions as I go, but I'm just not sure if the format of, of this session allows for that, but I'm always open to questions. I always do a little check and see where is this landing for people and is there questions? And I see Marie has her hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say that people just raised their hand. So whoever wants to ask. Okay. Yeah, thank you for this talk, but it's just like, I'm just like thinking, you know, from academic environment, uh, there is a lot of discussion about decolonization. I'm not sure if it's right word for indigenous uh, people because, because you are the local, right? So. That is that is rather weird, but in academic environment, I have a feeling that uh, in the in the in the top management, you have these like uh, white middle class men who always got everything uh, right and never had any problems, and then uh, then they are having to address this question. And they do that uh, the way that whenever there is a call for position, they, they hire whoever of color just to have secured back. <laughs> um, so in, in, in the insecure position under them, right? This, uh, this guy has said, guys have seniors and everything. So I am, uh, I am wondering like uh, what? What is the strategy? I mean, this is this is not not the way to change anything, right? So, I mean, it's it's almost even better. So, <laughs> if, if you see what I mean. So, Marie, if you could for me repeat the question. I I, I don't know if you were you asking me what is the strategy or. What is the strategy to, you know, like when you critic the the Western board philosophy, uh, where I actually don't count myself uh, either, uh, but uh, uh, if you if you critic that, uh, what uh, uh, what is the strategy to turn? Uh, I mean, is it a revolution or is it, I, I mean, I, I don't really know, like, um, uh, you know, I'm now sitting, uh, sitting in the, in the project where we got this uh, Western white middle class uh, man who always got it all and uh, they are discussing so much about decolonization and they, they, uh, the perspective is that they will write a theoretical paper. Well, if it, I'm not sure if I'm going to get the question right, but I'm going to try. Um, I what we what we try to show at Boldness is because we are a research and development shop, and so we will quite often create the information and the narrative that outlines 
many imperatives. And so we can make a business imperative, we can make the moral imperative, like and so on and so forth, about how not involving the voices of our families when you're designing systems for them, um, how that's bad for business or that's bad for, like the or bad for, for morality in terms of the health and wellness outcomes are going to be awful. And there is a price tag to awful health and wellness outcomes. And there's a price tag in every, virtually every system. That's the interconnectedness of it all is that if child welfare is producing awful health and wellness outcomes for families and children, you're going to feel those effects in every other system out there. Child wealth, or sorry, justice, education, mental health, um, housing, you name it. And so we can point to the imperative who cares because it's about the indigenous people you said that there is that majority that's majority and then the, the this uh, this uh, people on top mm -hmm. <laughs> so again we can make we can make the moral imperatives on that and so in canada there is right now a lot of momentum around things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action. There's momentum building for the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and the 213 calls to justice. And you know we have the United Nations on the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So there's lots of um, studies and commissions and calls for action and justice out there that people are beginning to understand why they need to pay attention and why that affects them. And so on a moral level, you know, when we hear about, for instance, unmarked graves, like we just know on a human rights level that that is wrong. <laughs> and we all need to do something about that. So again, I can go into lots of examples of where the moral imperative is there. And then I can also tie an economic comparative to that if we need to. Like, and it's not to say that we're trying to put price tags on lives, because that is not what I'm saying here at all. But I'm telling you that in 2018, the provincial government spent $500 million on child protection. And when we break down where that money went, a big chunk of it, for instance, does not go to build the capacity of Indigenous people. Therefore, that's a that's a never-ending uh, road to go down. The amount of money it's going to take to keep that system going is going to forever increase because we continue to break down families and we continue to produce really bad health and wellness outcomes for children which is gonna to continue to deteriorate families and therefore the price tag is just gonna keep going up and up and up. So that's how we can link things like, you know, health and wellness outcomes and price tags and so on and so forth. So, so I think it's creating more factual information around that. I feel like Canada has not had really good factual information around that and therefore, you know, truth before reconciliation, you know, there are portions of Canada and portions of the world that did not know about residential schools because it is not, it hasn't historically been in our curriculum. And the information about Indigenous peoples that has been in the past in our curriculum has been wrong, and some of it still is. Um, and so it's, so we're, so as Canadians, we're not taught this in our educational settings. I mean, it's starting to change now. But historically, it hasn't. And so when things come along, like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, a lot of that information was new to people. And so, you know, as a Canadian, there's a lot of anger out there that A, Canadians were not told about this, and B, that, you know, that this was allowed to happen. And C, I'd go further, is that what, what a lot of Canadians aren't necessarily fully aware of, I don't think, like, and I'm talking about Canadians in general, is that the harms of all of these past atrocities continue today and that we as Canadians still are benefiting from uh, those atrocities. And so in Manitoba, for instance, we have hydroelectricity and that has become, is, is a result of, 75% of that is a result of uh, altering our river uh, in Treaty 5 territory, the Nelson River. And 
we have done awful things to Treaty Five Nations to be able to get that water and to have that hydroelectricity. And so as, as Manitobans, we benefit right now from hydroelectricity, but what we've done to indigenous people in those communities is awful. And we haven't fully um, corrected that or, or uh, reconciled that or done that, done what we need to do to make that right. And I can go on about the clean drinking water because again, Winnipeg enjoys clean drinking water. We have since the you know early 1900s and we've done awful things to Show Lake 40 to get that clean drinking water. Show Lake 40 wasn't able to drink their own water since about till about two years ago, I think. And we've done some pretty awful things to that community in order for Winnipeg to get that water. So I can go on and on about that, but I see that Evan also has his hand up. Hi, thank you so much for this. I I have two questions. Um, the first is, uh, so I was really struck when you said that the theory of change came from the indigenous communities that you were working with. And I'm wondering sort of as someone who uh, is working using design methods, do you feel like there's other methods, methodologies, ways of knowing that we should be looking to the indigenous community for in uh, to, to bring into other forms of work, right? I mean, could indigenous knowledge really in, in, inform scientific practice, for example, or should we be thinking about different ways to read things? Like what, what other sort of influence should indigenous knowledge have on, on other kinds of knowledge production? So the short answer is absolutely. <laughs> um, and then it's to provide the examples that I'm aware of. I think there's lots of things out there that, that even I'm not aware of. But I will say that I like really pointing to, say, the work of, say, John Burroughs, who's out in on the West Coast. And he talks about being able to read the land. And that's how we gauge literacy. That's how he talks about literacy. Um, and so I, I love his his work because um, it really shines a light on that in a big, big way. But I know here in Manitoba, listening to our elders, they talk about natural law. And so you'll hear sometimes about seven grandfather teachings. There's many, many teachings, but we'll talk about seven grandfather teachings or seven sacred teachings. And one of those teachings is the teaching of truth. And that to me is a lot about fundamental truth and natural law. And so, um, you know, gravity is gravity and, you know, nature is nature. And, and if, as humans, if we could just listen to nature, nature is pretty uh, sophisticated. <laughs> and when we look at, like, I even think about things like the Mandelbrot set and fractal theory. And, you know, you look at all these scientific uh, knowledges out there, which show, you know, the patterns from the very small all the way to the infinite. Like that's nature talking to us. And so if we could follow the teachings of nature, we as humans would be way better off. And so you'll, you'll hear those teachings, I think in a lot of indigenous cultures out there to say that, that that's this whole idea of not privileging humans and being human centric that we are all, you know, we're the most in, smartest thing, like we're not. <laughs> um, and, and so sometimes we can be pretty dumb. And, and if we could just follow the teachings of mother nature or mother earth um then we would consider ourselves to be very literate so that that sort of answers a little or was one response to to the question you asked um so i know those that approach to be for sure in one of the indigenous or many indigenous nations out there do follow that kind of thinking is this we just need to follow and listen to again, the elder that I was listening to the other day, he, he kept saying, we have to prepare ourselves to listen to all my relations. And he was really talking about the preparedness, like with the things we need to do to prepare ourselves so we can listen. <laughs> and then once we listen, we will be enlightened and then we then we follow, right? Then we then we can follow the lead of, of all my relations. Um, and then more specifically, if I do talk about the humans side of it, for us, we went into talking to our families because we're saying, okay, everyone's talking about systems change. So what do you think about systems change? And they would tell us what they thought needed to, to change. And really a lot of what they said was, um, if, 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 you, if we could work with families in such a way, and again, if you go to Boldness website, we do have our theory of change on there. Um, and I'm just gonna say, we, we represent it in a wordle. And some of those wordles are 
for instance, things like, and I'm just going to throw a bunch of words out there, strength-based, uh, families are experts, prevention, uh, secure attachment, relationship, um, humility, belonging, uh, families at center. Like, so there's a, all these things that they're saying to us. And that's the, if we work with our families in those ways, um, we will just design better everything. And I feel like so many of us, all of us out there in all the different fields, just have no structured way to tap into the voices. And so if you're talking about working with youth or what have you, like, cause we do a little bit of work with youth here as well. Um, like we just have, so we, we think we're going to invite, invite sometimes youth into our spaces, like as adults, and then can't understand why those spaces possibly don't work for the young people. <laughs> we don't think about going into their spaces and, 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 you know, connecting with them in the ways that they've designed or in the ways that they um, thrive or in the ways that they feel most comfortable, right? So, uh, so I just feel like that's the, so I threw out that thing about fractal theory, you know, it's how we just repeat these patterns over and over and over again. And so for me, that's the one piece, I mean, I think there's many, many, many ways to do this work. So the idea of even polylithic thinking versus monolithic thinking, that's, so there's this many, many ways to do this work. And, but for me, a starting place can be centering the voices, find a way to get those voices at the center. And when you do that, I find even with boldness, and, I, and I've been doing this work for like uh, lots and lots of years before boldness. Um, and so I felt like I knew a lot about working with community and I felt like I knew a lot about what community was saying. Um, and even then at the beginning of boldness and still even now, like once in a while, we, we go down our path and I go, oh, of course, like, cause the community will correct us. Right. And say, no, 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 you're, you're not, you need to go in this other direction or you need to do it in a different way. And then I go, oh, right. Of course. Like that was just so obvious. And yet here we were going that way. And so for instance, the idea of centering, um, the people, if you're trying to design a system, you got to center those people in that system or in that, in that thinking. And so the idea of the zero to six, I mean, the elders, the first, when we went to talk to them, the first thing they said was, why are you picking the age six? Like, what is that? What's the purpose? Why, why six? Like out of all the ages you could have picked, why that one? And I had to really go back and think about that. And it was because a lot of our data sets and data gathering and statistics are centered upon when kids hit the school system and the school system is about six years old. And so that's not necessarily an age and stage for a child, but it's the system is, is, you know, there's a difference for humans at the age of six. And so then those elders were like, oh, so you, you put the school system at the center of that instead of the kids. <laughs> and I was like, oh, darn it. We kind of did. Yeah. Right. And so anyway, so there's just little things like that and that, when you go to our community, they just say it. And then, and then it's like a light bulb in your head and, you're, and then you feel silly that you didn't see it yourself. Right. Um, so I feel like that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I would always give is create structures within whatever project organization, you know, whatever thing you're working on and be intentional about it and you have to resource it. And so we talk about economic reconciliation as well. And so you know, we try really hard to resource the voice because there's a lot of, there's way more barriers to our families getting to the engagement table than others. And so, you know, we resource, we take try to take away as many barriers to participation as possible. So that's transportation, if that's food, if that's childcare, um, you know, if that's an honorarium, like you name it, right? Like we, we will provide as much as we can to support that participation, recognizing that historically, if you've read the book Indigenomics, I mean, there's other books too, but that, um, you know, Indigenous people have been systematically cut out of this economy in Canada. We have systematically been marginalized to the point where we have not financially prospered and continue to not pros financially prosper. And so we're trying to change that but it starts by recognizing that, you know, when the first settler came here and then when Canada was being formed, they needed the land. They needed the land in order to develop as a country and to prosper. And so they needed to get us off the land. And that's what residential schools is all about. That's what the, 
colonization is all about. That's what the Indian Act is all about. It's like getting us off the land and into these reservation little smaller parcels and keeping us there and, and getting us off of this, you know, hunting pattern that was interrupting farming, you know, and, you know, and that therefore giving us some of these treaty, $5 treaty payments are all about, right? You get your ration of flour and sugar kind of thing, <laughs> and, you know, as a, as a alternative to you out there hunting for your own uh, sustenance or your own survival. And so, um, sorry, I got off track there. But <laughs> so that's, I think that's a, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, and uh, for the record, I love fractals. So nothing, <laughs> nothing wrong there. Um, and I guess the, the other question is, I so I, I guess I missed this. Uh, what is the significance of Bigfoot? Because Bigfoot is in the, the picture behind you and it's on your earrings. I, I must have missed it. I just have a personal um, um, connection and, and appreciation for the teachings of, for Anishinaabe, we call uh, call Bigfoot um, Sabe. And so it is a being in, in our culture. There's lots of beings in our culture and like the, the Thunderbirds and the thunder, you know, where the thunder and lightning come from that comes from our thunder beings. Uh, and so Sabe is one of those beings. And um, when I talked about the seven sacred teachings, each of those seven sacred teachings is connected to a being. And so the truth teaching, for instance, is connected to turtle. The honesty teaching, the act of being honest and to speak honestly is a uh, connected to Sabe. And, and so Sabe is, is the symbol for that honesty teaching. Different cultures uh I, I think lots of cultures around the world have a being like Sabe or Bigfoot or Sasquatch you know there's different names that are that are used um I have heard some pretty amazing wonderful teachings from the west coast um about Bigfoot there and and it is different than Anishinaabe teachings but still quite wonderful and and I just love listening to all the teachings about you know this being um so that for me, anyway, so I just, I forgot that I had it as my screensaver. And this is, I mean, this screensaver is, um, if, you, if you know, everyone's always trying to find proof, you know, of these beings. And, and so this is a pretty iconic image of, you know, when there was proof of a being because somebody caught this on video. Um, and so it's, yeah, so I, I just put it there because I kind of like the background. And then I, I just happened to wear my Sabe earrings today and I did, forgot that I had that as my screensaver. But I do love Sabe. I have Sabe everywhere. I have it hanging in my car mirror. And yeah, I have Sabe everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marie, I don't know if you have another question or if that is from before. That's another question or a little bit from before to clarify myself as well like uh, basically do i understand it right that to fight for uh, indigenous rights and for indigenous uh, way of thinking you anyway have to go through western system to to put these fights right so that's that's uh, uh, yeah yes i would say that lots of Canada is based on Western thinking for sure. And so that's a fact and we have to work with that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so I do feel like there are some similarities where, you know, these things can work in tandem with each other. These approaches can work in tandem with each other. And then I think there's other situations where the approaches are complete opposite of each other and therefore a lot of tension rises and so um we're always trying to create space for more uh indigenous kinds of approaches when it comes to the scaling yeah like because that's always the big question that people like people think prototyping is cool but then everybody wants to know impact and they associate scaling with impact and so where have these prototypes scaled and sometimes they've again and if you've read the um um, I can't remember the second person, but Darcy Riddell, and there was another gentleman that came up with these five ways of scaling. And so we do use that model here at Boldness. And there's lots of different ways you can scale. So, you know, there's basically scaling out, scaling deep, scaling up, 
and so on and so forth. And so scaling can mean policy changes. Scaling can mean just quantity, like you're just doing more and more. And so we are always trying to track here at Boldness, like how we have scaled. And then we try to talk about the impact of that. We definitely work with the willing. And so folks who want to learn more, who want to change how and what they're doing, yes, uh, we will work with folks like that. Um, we we don't, we're not necessarily, because we're, we're a small shop, so we're not necessarily going to take on the highly resistant. <laughs> so that's work for possibly somebody else. Um, and And maybe this is possibly a question you're asking. There is a difference between centering Indigenous wisdom and decolonizing. And so, you know, sometimes we talk about, and the other slide I had there, the talk I give is about uh, because we're talking about innovation, every, a lot of folks want to talk about um, thinking outside the box. And I always, that one always was very curious to me because I thought, well, it's still a box. <laughs> like you're still centering the box if you're thinking outside the box. And so we have always been um, putting out there the narrative of thinking inside the circle. And so, again, I might equate thinking outside the box with a more how to decolonize something. Whereas thinking inside the circle is, is more of actually centering indigeneity. And so where are we um, creating resources and services and supports that just fundamentally are centering indigeneity, which can be different than helping a big system change into something else or, or to adopt certain practices, which might be more of a decolonizing where that system is still a Western system but within it, it can adopt some other different kinds of approaches. Um, and so, so again, back to that polylithic thinking is that there's many, many ways um, and there's small ways and big ways. And so we're just gonna keep on the pathway of, of just putting out you know, all the different approaches that we can think of. And, and, and at the end of the day, I do feel like when, you know, that whole thing about if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Um, families will always gravitate to the thing that feels best for them. And so if we design systems um, in a certain way, they're going to gravitate towards those systems. And, and if they, and they will not go toward those other systems that aren't serving them well. And so I have fundamental faith in that. And around the systems thing, I will say that when I came across the matriarchs in the North End, the women who were doing all the work, um, they were immediately systems thinkers. And that's where I really, uh, beyond a textbook, like that's where I really understood systems thinking. Because fundamentally they would say, the problem is not in the individual capacity of our families. Like, again, it's not that they don't know how to parent, it's not that they're criminals, it's not that they don't know how to run businesses, so on and so forth. It, it is not their individual capacity that is causing these outcomes. It is systems are in place creating these outcomes for our families. And therefore, the work we do has to be directed at those systems. And I, I love Pareto. <laughs> so I will say, because I it's a, it's a concept that resonates with me about the 80-20 thing. Um, I've seen in our in the North End that, you know, it feels to me like 25% of the time our families are asking for a a service or a resource or something that will improve their individual capacity. So budgeting program, parenting program, something like that. 75% um, of the time they're asking for help fighting a system. You know, they're looking to get housing. They're looking to get a job. They're looking to get their kids back. They're looking to like, you know, not get pulled into the justice system. So on and so forth. Like 75% of the time, our families are asking us to help them fight off a system. And so the matrix knew that from day one. And so they knew it was like, you have to take a systems thinking approach to the work we're doing with families. Um, and therefore, when you think about our funding models and our funding structures, you know, where does the funding go? For the most part, you get funding, not for profits anyways, you get funding because there's a problem, right? You get funding because individual capacity is not there. And so you get funding to run parenting programs and budgeting workshops and things like that um and so you you don't get funding to fight systems <laughs> like that's not you put the proposal <laughs> uh you know you, you get you get funding to support a, a person or a family 
navigate sometimes, like sometimes they might cop to navigating, but <laughs> um, yeah, so well, then we have to change our we have to change our funding structures, right? And then the funding, you know, the form follows function kind of thinking. The the funding structures to some point or to, in some way determine the service structure, right? And so we talk about thinking inside the circle and the box. Well, a lot of our current modern day service uh, structures are that triangle, which was the industrial revolution, right? So you got command and control at the top and then everybody do what's, being told and then at the bottom of the pyramid we're all punching out the exact same wheel for the for the car right like that's the assembly line industrial revolution model that has allowed certain parts of of society to really thrive and and prosper and then we tried to take that same uh structure and put it on humans well that does not work for humans because we are not the exact same so our families in our prototyping and in terms of that theory of change our families are constantly being asked, are asking us to serve them in a way that's highly customized. And so they, more often than not, they will say no to a standardization because it doesn't fit everyone. And so we can't, so we can't design our service industry off of this standardization approach. And then the idea that, oh, if you standardize it, then it's all equal. It is not. <laughs> the stand, that standardized approach ironically leads to more inequality. <laughs> And so we talk more about working in, on, in equity spaces versus equal. We want to get to equality. That would be great, but we are not there. And so we need to really lean into equity and how is it, how can we structure ourselves to recognize and work through equity so that we may then get to uh, equality. And so thinking inside the circle allows for that customization. Because when you're highly relational, highly relational, you know all the nuance and you know that right now I can see five folks across the top of my screen. I don't have the thing fully up, but I see five people. I'm going to guess that if I offered you say water right now, like what do you really, really need? I bet you, you would all give me a different answer. Like probably some of you don't need it. Maybe some of you need two gallons of it and maybe some of you need a cup. Well, that's what our families do. Right. And so it doesn't make sense to give everybody a cup when the needs are all varied. And yet I have enough water to serve you all, but to dole it out equally like that doesn't make any sense. But somehow we say, if we don't do it equally like that, somehow it's unjust, <laughs> um, which again, I think indigenous thinking turns that on its head. And we talk about justice in some very different ways. We talk about equity in some different ways. We talk about equality in some very different ways. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, I'm kind of ranting there again, but. Um, so much. I have one question out of the curiosity, and forgive me that I am uh, ignorant Central European and also really knowledgeable uh, about this issue. But uh, do the indigenous people in Canada consider themselves also as Canadian, like at least majority or uh, uh, minority, or how 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 are the feelings? Well, I think there's a varied feeling out there. I, I, we're not, again, we're not a monolith. <laughs> so I think Indigenous people think many different ways about that. Um, one of the thoughts out there is that we are a distinct uh, people, like Indigenous people are distinct. We were here originally, and that's why we have a very distinct relationship with Canada. There is a piece of legislation called the Indian Act, that outlines that relationship and there's no other nation in Canada that I'm aware of that has that kind of a relationship with Canada. Um, if you talk with different Indigenous people across Canada, some folks will be proudly Canadian and some folks will say no way like I'm not Canadian I'm Anishinaabe or I'm something else right because trying to recognize the distinct nature of the original people of this land. Um, and so yeah, so we're, yeah, so I don't, <laughs> that's just one quick little blip on, on the, there's lots written about that. And there's lots of um, yeah. debate about that, the answer to that. And so, and there's not any one way that people are thinking about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so it looks like we're done. Sorry, it is already 3.02. But um, 
anyway, I, I've enjoyed sitting in the circle with you. I hope that um, we got at some of the things that you were looking to hear. <laughs> and I know that you've had some really great speakers so far, and, and it's going to carry on for a little bit longer. But I am um, very grateful to be sitting in the circle with you today. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you so much.